Today, this is a familiar sight in the winding lanes and timbered villages and towns of Cheshire and Worcestershire, where for centuries men have produced salt. It's one of the special vehicles operated by the Salt Division of ICI for delivering salt in bulk direct from maker to user without any handling. And it clearly shows how the most modern methods are now being applied in this age-old industry. Now let's leave the driver of this 24-tonner, though you'll see him again later, and move 30 miles or so north to someone else on the road whose job is also concerned with salt. This is Bill Donaldson who sells ICI salt. Today he's got a number of customers to visit. And if we travel along with him, we can learn quite a lot about this versatile chemical, common salt, the variety of its uses in industry, and the way it enters into the manufacture of so many things in our everyday lives. Donaldson's first call is to a municipal authority, one of whose jobs it is to keep roads clear of ice and snow in the winter. Salt's very effective for this purpose, and the kind best suited for the job is ground rock salt. This is one of the depots of the Liverpool Corporation, where the salt is stored in bunkers holding several hundred tons. Donaldson's called to see an official of the city engineers and surveyors department. Ah, good of you to come over. Nice to see you. I see you've had the new lot of salt delivered. Yes, it arrived yesterday. You've still got plenty of the old stuff left. Well, we didn't have very much snow last year, you know. Oh, I don't know. What about that bad patch in February, wasn't it? Oh, yes. We did have one rather bad fall of snow. In fact, one night, we had to shift some 400 tons of salt to get the road clear of snow. I had about 300 men out altogether. Good heavens, really. What I should really like to know, Mr. Donaldson, is whether to use the old stock first. Doesn't really matter. This salt keeps almost indefinitely, even if it's stored in the open with no cover at all. But doesn't it dissolve away in the rain? No, this kind of salt soon forms a thin crust, which prevents that. It isn't very hard, and easily breaks down when you come to use it. Oh, that's fine, then. Rock salt comes in its natural state from this mine at Winsford in Cheshire. It's over a hundred years old, and is now the only working salt mine in the British Isles. The salt is mined in these vast caverns, which have been cut through the solid beds of rock salt buried 500 feet below ground. The working conditions are safe and pleasant, and it's warm and dry throughout the year. The face is undercut, as in coal mining. The colour of the rock is due to the presence of a small percentage of marl or clay. Shot holes, which have been drilled in the face, are each charged with explosive and a detonator. The detonators are then wired together, and the firing cable is connected and brought to the firing point. The shot fire warns everyone in the vicinity that a shot's going to be fired. Fire number two! This one blast has brought down something like 500 tons of rock salt. It's loaded mechanically into shuttle cars, capable of carrying about four tons at a time. crushing and screening, some of the salt goes direct to customers. And the rest is stored in stockpiles near the mine head and looks very much as it did when you saw it at the municipal depot. Rock salt, of course, isn't only used for snow clearing, but also for various agricultural and industrial purposes. 
But this is only one of the types of salt sold by Donaldson. White salt, a purer product made from brine, is needed by many of his customers, including the one he's visiting now. This customer collects hides and skins from the slaughterhouses and preserves them by salting before they're sold to the tanners, where they'll eventually be turned into leather for shoes, handbags and other leather goods. He uses two different kinds of salt. A coarse salt, granular, for cattle hides like these being stacked here, and for his sheep and calf skins, a finer salt, dendritic, with good spreading and absorbent properties. Ah, this is your salt stall. That's where I keep my granular salt. Of course, you've always been a great believer in granular salt, haven't you? Yes, it's just the thing for hides, and it keeps well, too. What about dendritic salt? I'm using this for sheep and calf skins. Uh-huh. Sticks on well, doesn't it? And there's very little waste. That's true. Funny name, that. Dendritic. What did you say it meant? Dendritic? Well, actually, it means branched, like a tree. It comes from the Greek. If you look at it closely under the microscope, you'll see why the research boys call it that. And here are some crystals of dendritic salt, greatly magnified. Careful study of the crystallization of different types of salt in the research department of salt division leads to improved grades and methods of manufacture. Here, side by side under the microscope, are cubic crystals of vacuum salt and the star-like crystals of dendritic. Vacuum is salt division's main product. It's a fine, even grain salt, which is suitable for most uses. ICI dendritic is one of the division's special products. Its particular crystal shape gives the salt its characteristics of extra rapid solubility and good moisture absorbing properties. ICI granular is another special product. Its large crystal size caters for the needs of users who require a coarse salt. In the department's analytical laboratory, the quality of the salt is constantly checked. This laboratory assistant is taking for analysis representative samples of granular and dried vacuum salt. You can see quite clearly the difference in grain size between the two types. Here, the non-caking properties of two types of salt are being compared. The samples, which have been moistened and then dried in an oven, are tipped onto fine meshed sieves. This one's caked, and large lumps remain on top of the sieve. The other sample passes through freely. Impurities in the brine from which white salt's made must be removed. And in the research laboratories, they're always seeking improved methods of doing this. The brine must be turned into salt, and this is done by evaporation. In this small-scale evaporator, the salt crystals can be seen falling into the glass vessel below. The problem is, of course, how to do this efficiently and economically on a large scale. Here, the same process is being carried out in slightly bigger research apparatus. Now for the same process on the full scale. In the works, evaporation and crystallization take place in large enclosed vessels. This plant is part of stokeworks near Droitwich in Worcestershire. The brine is pumped from underground and stored in open-air reservoirs. It's carried to the works by pipelines. To evaporate the brine, steam is needed. This boiler provides the steam which generates all the electricity required in the works and then passes on to heat the brine in the evaporators. The three types of salt, vacuum, dendritic and granular, can be produced here. To make dendritic, an additive is introduced into the evaporating brine. 
granules made by retaining the crystals in the evaporating brine and so allowing them to grow larger. At Western Point, another of Salt Division's works, are what are probably the biggest salt evaporators in the world. From outside, one has no idea of how they work, so let's come in close and try to explain the process, showing how the fuel is used as economically as possible by multiple effect evaporation. In the vacuum plant, evaporation takes place under reduced pressure. Brine is introduced into the evaporators and then kept at a constant level throughout the process. It circulates through tubes inside the evaporator. Steam from the boilers heats the tubes in the first evaporator. The brine boils and gives off its own steam, while salt crystals begin to form and fall to the bottom. The steam coming off the brine goes forward to heat the tubes in the second evaporator. Then this steam from the boiling brine is used in turn to heat the third, and so on, hence multiple effect evaporation. Rotary filters separate the salt from the brine. Some of the salt from the filters is carried direct to a warehouse capable of holding several thousand tons at a time. From here, this undried salt is loaded by grab into lorries or rail wagons for dispatch to all parts of Britain. The rest is dried and stored in enclosed silos. Some still leaves the works in bags, but more and more of it's being delivered in bulk. At Western Point Works on the Manchester Ship Canal, salt's loaded direct into coasters or ocean-going ships. Well, we've seen salt made, now let's see some more users. Large tonnages are used by the chemical industry, where it's a raw material for many different processes. Agriculture is another big user. Ground rock salt is used as a fertilizer for sugar beet and other crops. Vacuum salt goes into animal foods. From agriculture to industry, here at Bradford certain dyeing processes call for the addition of salt. It's added either dry or in the form of brine while the material is being run through the dye bath. The salt helps the transfer of the dye stuff from the liquor to the material being dyed. These rayons will eventually be used as dress or furnishing materials. Large quantities of salt are used for regenerating water softeners. Here, undried vacuum is being delivered direct into a saturator at a water company's works. The baker too needs salt, because without it, his bread will be flavorless and uninteresting. It also helps to control fermentation of the yeast. Salt goes into many other types of food. In bacon curing, for example, granular is used. The shoulder pockets of the sides of bacon are first stuffed with it. The sides are then injected with pickle, in which salt is a major ingredient. They are then placed in the curing tanks and sprinkled with more salt before being immersed in pickle. After four or five days in the tank, the bacon's taken out, stacked, and left to mature. It is, in fact, a bacon cure that Donaldson's with at the moment. The purpose of his visit is to help clear up a problem that's arisen in the customer's use of salt. With Donaldson's, another ICI man. Bailey is from the Technical Service Department, which tackles any technical problem facing a customer. This manufacturer found that his cure had taken on a cloudy brownish colour, and his bacon wasn't keeping as well as it should. Originally, he was under the impression that the salt was to blame, and Donaldson sent samples to the Technical Service Department for examination. Bailey's been telling the manager the result. Now, let me get this clear. You found there's too much nitrite in the pickle. Yes, and that's linked to the salt concentration, which hasn't been kept up to its proper level. Aye, ah, I can see that from your figures. We've obviously slipped up somewhere on the quantities. I must get my chaps to keep a closer check on density. That's right. And if I may make a suggestion, try adding a little more salt when you're sprinkling. 
Then you'll automatically keep up the strength in your colour brine and so maintain the proper colour. Like this new lot you just made up. That'll mean having to scrap some of the old pickle, I suppose. Yes, I'm afraid so. So you were right. It wasn't your Richard Salt that was to blame after all. You're forgiven. Good. Then that saves my bacon. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, you'll find you won't have any more trouble. Well, thanks a lot. Grateful for your help. Oh, by the way, you let me have that drawing of the wet storage dissolver you suggested. Certainly. We'll send you something next week. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Problems like these aren't an everyday occurrence. But when they do arise, it's the technical service department's job to help by consultation, advice and experiment. Donaldson's last visit is to a customer who uses hundreds of tons of salt a year, the CWS Margarine Works at Earlham. His call coincides with that of the bulk delivery vehicle. As a result of advice received from the technical service people on the best way of handling and storing large quantities of salt, this customer was one of the first to have salt delivered by these air discharge vehicles direct into silos. The driver connects a flexible hose carried on the vehicle to the intake pipe of the customer's works. He then starts up the compressor behind the cab and opens the discharge valve. The salt is blown by compressed air direct into the customer's storage silo. Each one of these silos holds 16 tons of dried vacuum salt. Well, I'm... Glad you're beginning to feel the benefit of bulk delivery, Mr. Rennie. It seems to have solved your old problem of storing and handling sacks. Yes, thank heaven. It certainly saved a lot of space on this floor. It's a darn sight tidier and cleaner. Well, the salt can't get contaminated this way. Straight from one silo into the other without any outside contact. Can't have anything cleaner than that. I expect you find it's cut out a lot of expense, too. Yes, I must admit, it's a big saving in time, space and money. Customer. Yes, you can there. Come on. Let's go to the works. This cooling machine solidifies the emulsion of blended refined oils, milk and salt. And the margarine scraped off in the form of flakes. Salt improves the taste of the margarine and helps in stabilizing the emulsion during manufacture. The margarine is mixed at high speed to improve the texture and pass through extruders. It's then taken in stainless steel tubs to machines where it's weighed, wrapped and packed ready for dispatch. We've seen how one customer has salt delivered in bulk into a silo. There are, however, others who have their salt delivered into a saturator. Vandenberg's and Jurgens Limited is one such customer. Here, the salt is blown from the air discharge vehicle direct into saturators, which both store the salt and produce the brine required by the customer. His visit to the margarine works over, Donaldson's day comes to a close. For him, it's just the end of another day, with the prospect of more customers to be visited tomorrow. The meeting of old friends, the making of new. For the driver of the air discharge vehicle too, it's finishing time. He checks in his empty vehicle at the Weybridge. A relief driver takes over and drives to the silos for a further load of salt. The day is over, but for the vehicle and the constant flow of salt from the works, the job goes on.